If you've ever been a machine learning engineer, you'll know that it's not the easiest job in the world. You're swimming in a plethora of tools, your work can involve a lot of fairly specific knowledge, the theory from your machine learning classes doesn't exactly apply to the real world. You deal with broken and changing datasets, discover seasonal patterns in shopping behavior, and forms of distribution shift. There's just a lot to deal with. When Shreya Shankar started working as the first machine learning engineer at Viaduct, she saw a lot of these problems firsthand. Eventually, she decided that a number of the problems that plague machine learning engineers today could do with scientific study. So, in her PhD, Shreya studies what is often termed ML ops, or in other words, the art of making machine learning work in the real world. This conversation focuses on how Shreya got into the problems she's studying today and how she thinks about the modern ML landscape, from her previous studies on ML ops and ML engineering best practices, to how her research applies to LLMs and prompt engineering. This is the Gradient Podcast, and I am your host, Daniel Bashir. If you enjoy these episodes, you can follow us wherever you're listening to this podcast episode. You can also follow us on Substack, to get regular notifications whenever we release a new article, newsletter, or podcast episode. You can also find our online magazine at thegradient.pub, where we regularly publish essays by the sorts of people I interview on the podcast. And finally, if you enjoy the episode, it would mean a great deal to us all if you'd consider leaving us a review on whatever podcast player you're using to listen to this episode. It helps more listeners like you find what we're doing, and helps us bring in more interesting guests for you to listen to. But now, without further ado, Shreya Shankar. So Shreya, I and probably many of our listeners have been following a lot of your work on ML Ops. I think you're doing a lot of really interesting research, but... Maybe to backtrack a little bit before you got into ML engineering and then thinking about ML engineering as a research problem, how did you get interested in ML in the first place? Yeah, um, I was doing my undergrad when like, character artists came out. Um, and this felt like a very pivotal moment I think in AI at the time, because I think this was like the first people had just seen GANs, people had just seen RNNs, like very, very kind of small, but like the hope of generative AI was like born, I think around like 2014, 2015, 2016. Um, and I, I happened to be at Stanford where people were kind of doing a lot of this work or similar work. Um, and there were maybe at least like three or four deep learning classes. I think now there's like 20 deep learning classes. But at that time, like everyone wanted to take deep learning for natural language processing and deep learning for computer vision. Um, and all I was hearing was deep learning, deep learning. So, I mean, I don't think I have like a particular insightful or interesting story around just taking this class because it was being offered and everyone else wanted to take it. But as somebody who also had other kind of interdisciplinary interests like I was interested in music um I kind of saw a lot of the google magenta work around using rnns to generate music or um, how do we kind of project songs into like low dimensional space and see what songs are related things like that and you know like this these are such cool like homework assignments for like 18 19 year olds um and I think that's what really, really got me hooked. Like the idea that like I could see an application right now, I could within one month of learning machine learning or deep learning, I'll say deep learning, I could have an idea that is like somewhat not, like some part of it is somewhat novel. I don't think any other science or STEM field um, was moving at this pace at that time. Um, so I think that's that's really what hooked me for sure. 
It's interesting you mentioned those specific advancements in music because I feel like it's very similar to my own story. Like I started college in 2016, oh. kind of caught the tail end of the years you're talking about. And the first research lab I worked in was actually on music information retrieval. So exactly kind of what you're thinking about. Although yeah. I think the the project I kind of got thrown at was less on the end of, of generative things, but we were like interested in identifying a piece of music by a picture of the sheet music which turned out to be like yeah. a much, much harder problem than we anticipated. I think like when I was totally. working on it, our advisors thought was let's just like throw everything into a CNN and kind of see what happens. And I think it took like another year or two and like three other groups of research students getting thrown at it for them to develop a solution. But yeah. it's kind of funny. Um, I definitely felt like a very similar feeling at the time. It was like... Um, I don't know. I guess I, I didn't see as much of the generative stuff just because of the particularities of what I was working on. But totally. it did feel like there was kind of some sort of fundamental shift going on. Yeah, there's a huge shift, I think, in the Stanford undergrad class ecosystem where, I mean, all of us had taken like intro AI and intro machine learning from Andrew Ng. And we were learning like SVMs and logistic regression and all of these like, I don't know, classical machine learning, I don't know what term you would give to it today. And then all of a sudden, everyone stopped getting interested in that. And then everyone went to like deep learning for natural NLP, deep learning for computer vision. There's like a deep reinforcement learning class that came up in like 2017 or something. But everyone was like, oh my God, deep RL, we got to take this class. Obviously, like, I was like, yeah, I got to take this class. Uh, so everyone kind of just like ditched. <laughs> Um, the kind of research agendas um, and classes, I think, that were previously offered. Um, yeah. And, and I think it was a lot of, there was a lot of room for undergraduates to get excited by research because um, this was like prior to like the era of, or, or maybe this was like around the beginning of the pre-training or when people were like, we should pre-train models. But there was a lot of work in kind of like constructing good data sets. There was a lot of work in constructing data sets for fine tuning, like pre-trained ResNet was all the rage, right? So or actually inception. So everyone was like, at least in music, it's like, can we collect like data sets that can be good for pre-training? How many data like points do you need? Um, and I, I think like that's where everyone collectively developed the like, um, not disillusionment, but it, it was tough, right? To collect these data sets, to make sure they were all clean to identify like how best to leverage the pre-trade models, et cetera. I think all of that is still there to some point now, but it's definitely become much, much easier, right? With like few shot learning, um, these like massively, massively pre-trained models. Um, and it's, it's much more exciting now, I think, but at the time it felt exciting. Yeah, the, the shift in accessibility for research you're pointing out is super interesting. I feel like that reflects kind of my own path with it where I, like many people, kind of got started with fast.ai sort of self-teaching so I could do research in this lab. And, you know, it's that very applied introduction. And I think it was only later on when I was like, wait, hold on a second. Let me like back up and develop like more of the ML fundamentals as well. Um, so there was definitely that reverse order. But I can see how there's this accessibility aspect. And, you know, now you have the point where I think even high schoolers are starting to get into this. And it's like, well, you actually can communicate these concepts in like a reasonably understandable way to somebody. And as you said, kind of get them up and going and like actively doing something and involved in the process where they can make like real contributions, which is really just, just super interesting. And I feel like, I mean, in some ways, you know, people have lots of things to say about like the competitiveness it introduces, but in some ways it's definitely a good thing thing, I guess, that it's more accessible and there are more ways people can contribute. Yeah, definitely. I'd love to trace a little bit about that evolution for you into working on ML engineering. You've said that you left your job as an ML engineer because, and I guess I'm quoting you here, several aspects of the job needed to be studied in research. For example, getting flooded with useless data validation alerts and on-call rotations could you tell me a little bit about your experience getting into ML engineering and then how that kind of led into some of the research ideas you're pursuing now? Yeah, I, I thought I wanted to do research at the time, either like at a company or go to a PhD. 
or at least at the time of graduating undergrad. But when I was writing my statement of purpose at the time, I didn't know really what to write because I felt like I was saying, like, I'm interested in, I've done research in adversarial examples. I'm interested in adversarial examples because X, Y, Z, and all of these things were like things people had told me, but I like didn't really know my own interests. And I was sitting here talking about like robustness, real world machine learning robustness. And it felt very contrived, like writing such a statement of purpose because I had never seen what it was like to try to use one of these machine learning models for something. Um, so I thought, okay, like maybe let me try having experience um, doing this. Uh, and I, I really thought that I would get experience with like real world adversarial examples. Um, I went to a startup as a machine learning engineer where we were building ML models for like connected vehicles. So um, because the domain is pretty high stakes, like connected vehicles, things need to work. Uh, I thought like, okay, I'm gonna learn about robustness to like real world challenges here and kind of see what applies. And, and I think it, they, I think it's a combination of many things. One, it was so early stage, like I was the first ML engineer, it was like prior to product market fit and et cetera. So I didn't get to, I didn't even work on any of the things that I thought I would work on. I thought I would be training models on data. No, I was building like integrators to like collect people's data. And then I was building cleaning jobs to clean that data. And then I was building like common schemas to aggregate this data. And then once I had all of this data, that took like a year, if not more, to just figure out what it is that needs to be done. The last thing I thought about was like machine learning models. I was like, okay, if we can have any simple rules, simple models, I'll be so thrilled because I just, I don't have the time to both ensure good data quality and like monitor and train machine learning models, especially for really hard problems, like hard class and balance problems. For example, things that have distribution shift, right? If you have sensor data, you're gonna have distribution shift all the time because like the weather changes, time changes, everything changes. And it was just, it was too much to kind of like see all of these problems come at, at once and realize I felt like, oh, in research, we, we study one of these problems at a time um, and, and it's slow and the solutions are a little bit complicated, right? Like making models robust to distribution shift. A lot of these solutions are incredibly complicated and no one is going to try to productionize such a thing because they have a million other things to worry about. I, I think that insight for me um, really came from the ML engineering experience. Um, and, and I felt like there were, I spent most of my problems like on data quality and data validation at the scale specific for machine learning or we take for granted in machine learning kind of the data is clean, not even just clean, it's balanced. Um, we like, we're not worried about like formatting errors, right? Like we're not trying to train on like PDFs and things like that. Well, maybe now like we're trying to, but around like 2017, 2018, we were not. Um, and, and I think just like there weren't people thinking about data quality for ML at an operational level. Um, so I, I think that was like the biggest research problem that I identified there that was like, okay, somebody needs to study this. And when I talked to people, nobody seemed to care about it in machine learning. And I think it's because like, how are you gonna get a NURBS? It's not about model training. Like nobody's gonna get a NURBS paper on this. And that's what actually got me interested in databases as a field because it's so broad. They'd like th thought about data quality and data validation for a really long time. But with the onset of machine learning right now, machine learning affords some flexibility in your data quality. It doesn't have to be perfectly clean. And now you want ha to have like larger and larger scale data. Um, so the data management community had only just started to think about this kind of problem. And they, I think um, when I was talking to people, not all of them had experience like deploying machine learning models, et cetera, the experience that I had as an engineer. So it kind of made sense uh, for me to join this community as like a good fit of researchers. I also really like that the database community is very accepting of like what is a research contribution, very open-minded. It's had to be because databases are everywhere and they've been along for, around like since 60s, 70s. Um, yeah, so that, that's kind of how I made my way back into the PhD, but in a completely different field. That makes a lot of sense to me. And I, I certainly had almost, I think, a, a parallel 
kind of experience to you, not necessarily working at a startup, but kind of entering a role where like I was designated as an applied scientist and I was like, oh, you know, this means I'm going to get to do a lot of modeling and like deep learning work. Right. Yeah. And I was like, no, none of that. I think I got to maybe work on, I spent about a year in this role and I think I worked on maybe one thing that could be considered modeling, but the rest of the time it was like <laughs> all, you know, working in pandas. SQL and like, yeah, pandas and doing data analysis and just kind of banging my head over these data sets and like not actually thinking about the modeling end of things. Yeah. And it's amazing how much time you can spend on that. And I guess maybe totally. that speaks to like, I don't know what it was for you, but just the tools at the time. And I, I suppose we're going to get into like better ways to do this, but just the the kind of manual work that is required of a person in dealing with all of that just was not conducive, I think, to like making fast progress on really anything. Yeah, I, here's how I like to describe ML why it's so hard in the engineering, ML engineering. It's like you're constantly learning things about the new, pro uh, sorry, you're constantly learning new things about the problem. And that's what makes it really hard. I think in traditional software or in a lot of, even when you're doing ML research, to some extent, you're not always like learning new things about the problem that forces you to rethink your entire solution all the time. And ML, this process is like a year you're like learning your problem, um, at least applied ML. And I, that, that's what really makes it hard. I don't know if it's a tools problem as much as it's like you can have the great latest or the greatest like Snowflake Snow Park. I can write Python to query my uh petabytes of data sure but at the end of the day i'm still always learning new things about my data and my ml problem and how people interact with it and that's what makes it so hard by way of maybe transitioning us a little bit into your research and some of the papers you've worked on i also really liked how you sort of articulated how your phd feels and, and again i'm quoting you you say that it feels like an exploration where you study how data management works, become a historian of the craft, and try to come up with views on how it will play out in the MLE ecosystem. And the historian of the craft part sounds really interesting. And I think you kind of started bringing this in when you discussed the database management literature and sort of how people have already begun thinking about related problems. I guess I'd love for you to introduce a little bit of that historical perspective as a segue to some of your research. So how you've thought about and begun to learn about some of the historical perspectives on how to solve the types of problems that we see as machine learning engineers, some of the technologies that have maybe evolved into the set of tools that like your modern ML engineer tends to use. Yeah, I think there's two kind of histories that you can follow, right? There's the AI ML like the modeling train, and then there's the all the tools and data management systems that we use, that we surround our model with. Um, I think there's this great like technical debt in machine learning paper from 2014 that really sparks the intersection kind of of the two um, kind of fields converging and flipping the switch on like, hey we've been thinking about training models for so long, but the model is only like a small fraction of our entire system. So now let's try to think about all of the other data management um, that plays around this model. Um, I don't I don't know where to begin when it comes to like history or things that we can learn um, from databases and data management. But, but some of the things that have really resonated with me as I have done my PhD in databases, um, are like dating back to SQL, like when Edward Codd wrote the original SQL paper um, and several companies slash research labs or whatever raced to like implement the first SQL system. Um, I, I really liked how the separation of physical or physical concerns are separated from logical concerns. Like this is a big thing in data management system. Like, your query language, your query layer like SQL, somebody who's using that doesn't need to know about the layout of where things are stored on the device or even on multiple devices, um, distributed devices, et cetera. Um, these, these two layers can really evolve 
independently, like their logical query plan can evolve independently from the physical query plan. And, and that, that really spoke to me because I felt like in machine learning, ML engineering, we, we weren't really thinking along that sort when trying to deploy models to production. You have one person who's managing the entire stack from like querying the model for inference to like, they also know where every single parameter of that model is stored and how that's accessed and how that's updated. Um, and this, this, I think this really makes it difficult for other people to kind of work on the same model for this model to evolve, or even the set of models of this company to evolve. You have all these tools like, you know, feature stores and model servers and all of these things that, that are trying to kind of separate, I guess, like physically from the logical part of the model. But I don't know, it, it just, it doesn't seem like as clean of a solution as like a database is, uh, or a database management system is. Um, and I think that like, that's something I'm really thinking about these days. It's like, I'm trying to figure out, okay, what is, how do we really separate like building and using these ML pipelines from all of the artifacts um, that need to be managed? And this is really hard, right? Because now it's not just data we need to manage, but it's also models we need to manage. And the fact that these models are generated frequently, like you can think of, a, of like views of your data. So they're like frequently recomputed frequently materialized views of their, your data. And now that's really hard because you have a whole large diversity of models to support, like from your SVM to like, I don't know, um, like large foundation models or whatever. Uh, models have different properties from like other SQL. There's so much research in the data management literature about how you can incrementally maintain um, views of data. But when it comes to like an SVM, how do you incrementally maintain an SVM? If I have an SVM, I get a new data point. Like, how do I incrementally? Like, all of these kinds of things, right? ML moves so fast that I think it's just so hard to really one-to-one -one map the concepts. So I think something I really struggle with is, like, how do I... What, when it comes to, like, building a ML data management system, how, how do you, like, build something that will stay for the next several years and one person can actually build... And it cleanly separates the usage from all of the nitty gritty storage and execution details. I think if somebody solves that problem, like then we'll be able to see progress like in the MLE tooling ecosystem. Yeah, even at the very basic level of this, the concept of like levels of abstraction and all of this and who has to pay attention to what, it always feels like a, a process of evolution, I guess for a while and this is becoming again, very important with LLMs being used a lot and trained. The um, Some of what you were speaking about knowing where parameters are stored. There's that kind of classical distributed systems problem. You'd like the person dealing with the model to interact and train and do whatever they're doing as though they were dealing with a single machine instead of having to care about how do I use all these distributed libraries and deal with yeah. whatever that deals yeah. with. It was kind of the same thing at like my previous company where they were building like AI accelerators. And I think that there was sort of this trajectory where um, the compiler infrastructure kind of early on was not good enough for um, the ML engineers and people working on applications to like not care about it. So if you came in on the applications team, you had to know a little bit about the infrastructure. You had to know a bit about the compiler to do anything. By the time I got there, the compiler was like sufficiently robust that I didn't have to care about it as much, although I still had to care about the infrastructure. But it does feel like there's this sort of like inevitable evolution in um, sort of that, I guess, robustness to things. And that seems to occur in lots of places. Yeah, it's really, really hard for machine learning. Like people are trying to glue all sorts of tools together and hope that, you know, now they have an end-to-end -end system, but in practice, they have to become experts of every single thing that they glue together. And like, that's not what you want, right? From a, that, that makes the job so hard to do and it makes it really hard for people to get into the job or break into the job, so. Yeah, so I guess I'd love to start diving into a couple of your research papers. And I think the first one that would be sort of interesting is towards observability for production machine learning pipelines. And I guess maybe a place to start with this is just some of the, the motivation here. So some of the difficulties you saw in dealing with these pipelines, kind of the, the case for observability. 
Yeah. Um, I, I probably dates back to my job, my, my job as MLE and also doing like various consulting where if you have a model in production, it is really hard to make sure that that model is consistently generating accurate or like whatever metric of performance you want to use good predictions. Um, and it's not just a problem for like small companies, but it's also a huge problem for like meta and Google and like these like bank style companies. Whenever I see that, I, like when, when everybody has a problem, like money cannot solve this problem sort of thing. Then it's interesting to me as a research question because it's like, okay, like clearly they're spending millions of dollars on such a thing um, and hiring all the best people to do it. But still, like, I don't know, it's not solved. Like these models are failing all the time um, and, and it's hard to deal with them. And that, that's how I went into this paper. Like that's kind of the seed that I had. Um, but, you know, like doing a lot of kind of work with other companies um, and other teams it became more clear like what the problems actually were like we in that paper we have a three-pronged framework like there's first the detection problem um and and throughout the whole progress pro process i think of this paper i was kind of trying to map it to traditional software because that's also what i have experience in um and in traditional like software observability you kind of have well defined somewhat well-defined criteria for when something is broken like uh, like you have SLIs, or, um, service level indicators. And and I thought that that was missing already in ML because people don't quite know whether something is broken. So the first step of observability is to be able to detect what broken means and when something is broken. Then the second part is the diagnosis part. Um, so that's, okay, we have a slight indication that something could be wrong then why is it wrong like what can we i don't know can we how do we explore where it's wrong this problem is really hard because it requires like you to have a bunch of logs that you can query to figure out what the bug is like people rarely want to roll back the salute the pipeline or the model to what it was at the time something was broken and then try to replicate it like that you're for sure going to break something like it's impossible to get nearly perfect reproducibility so um, this this poses the question like what information do you need to log at runtime so that you can properly diagnose something in the diagnosis step um, and then the third part is kind of okay now I know what could have gone wrong how do I fix it and this is very interesting in the ML case because I think a lot of people love to fix problems by uh, training the model on new data um, but a lot of times it's much easier to fix a problem by adding a simple guardrail or a rule or to do some rejection sampling um things like something like that right like those are much easier to do than to like collect a new data set or something if you like see a new failure mode um, so that reaction step is also hard right because there's no one clear way to solve the problem um you need to be somewhat experienced um I don't know, like, yeah, there's, there's no one clear way to solve problems. So that's kind of what this paper talks about. Um, and then we have like a nice case study um, of kind of implementing the first version of that roadmap. Yeah, so maybe beginning with the detection aspect of this, how is a pipeline doing in real time? And you've pointed this out in other places and other works that there's a good case to be made that maybe super coarse metrics like accuracy, for instance, aren't always going to be sufficient for us to diagnose, is this system behaving as intended in the way we want it to be? How is, how is your thinking about this detection aspect evolved? Yeah, uh, so multiple things make detection hard. One is if you don't have real-time labels, Groucho's labels, which who does, right? Because otherwise you would not be training a machine learning model. <laughs> Um, then how do you know kind of what is the accuracy at that point? Like that's, that's one challenge. Uh, the other one is feedback loops, right? If you're in Rexus and you get like somebody's clicking on your recommendation from an ML model, then you might like inadvertently kind of take them on some vendor and you don't really know how you have impacted your model 
because of these kind of tight feedback loops. And another thing that I don't think people talk about as much is that a lot of people try to make machine learning models the product. So when it comes to making service level indicators for machine learning, if you're so hell-bent, if you're YC startup, so hell-bent on making the ML model your product, then like something like accuracy, like you're, you're forced to think about how does accuracy map to revenue? Um, and so like ac you're, you're trying to like shoehorn yourself into thinking like, oh, accuracy is my product metric. And then I need to somehow map that to my business metric. And then like now I'll have something to monitor. And so people talk about like um, estimating the value from their machine learning models, all of these things. I think all of that is crazy because if you have good product metrics, you should just be able to monitor those. Or if you have good SLIs, like when something worked or didn't work as pertains to the product, right? So ML is like a small thing in the product. I don't think we've really gotten there. And especially now it's gotten so much worse with these LLMs where people are like so hell bent into having the AI be the product. And then it's really hard, right? To figure out whether something is broken. The AI could be perfect, but you're not making any money. And yeah, so so I think like that that third piece, I don't really know how if if it's a razor problem or not, but I think it's worth thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the accuracy as pitching your product definitely seems like a misguided way yeah. to think about all of this. Yeah. In in diagnosing things, and of course there are sort of lots of issues here. I guess so you you spoke to sort of logging as one way we're going to have to think about well how can we dig in and figure out what happened there's also this issue i guess with like real time ml systems of figuring out like when did something happen and if you are trying to diagnose how that happened of course there is multiple different types of data shift how did you i guess at the time sort of start to piece apart some of these different questions yeah um so for detection and like not knowing what the labels were in real time, we we talked about a solution um, that did like importance weighting um, and estimated the accuracy kind of based on representation in like your surf batch or like whatever batch of data was being served. And we found that like as long as you're like maintaining these buckets over time uh, or subpopulations over time, then you can get at least you can follow the trend for whether accuracy goes up. You won't be able to nail it, but you can follow the trend. So, okay, that's like better than not knowing anything. Um, for diagnosis, um, so so this this part I also did a lot in conjunction with Meta, which the other uh, data quality paper is on. Um, but a lot of the problems stem from like data quality problems, like some corruption in the data uh, either like gets a bad batch of predictions or like the worst part is it's being used to retrain a model. Um, and then that is like corrupting future predictions. So you kind of don't really know where it originates from. Um, and that's really hard to find. So like logging summaries of your uh, serve data is very, very helpful. Um, and then kind of evaluating some like data quality checks and constraints. And I can talk a lot about that with the other paper, the meta paper, uh, like how do you, th this goes back to like, how do you accurately put constraints on your data that will alert people? Um, because you don't want to send too many alerts, but you don't want to send too few alerts. So what, how do you know like when data is just broken enough to lead to a bad ML model? That's, that's that was the hardest problem I think for diagnosis. Um, but it was nice. It was satisfying to have that meta paper as a follow up, for sure, to be able to make some step toward that. Yeah, I guess I had that scheduled for a bit later, but maybe since you've provided the segue, we can jump directly into that meta paper. So, yeah, if we maybe want to make the connection to moving fast with broken data and this problem of automatic data validation for production ML pipelines, maybe we could start with sort of some of the existing data validation measures for ML and then sort of where things fall short for you? Yeah, um, there was, there's a lot of like, there's some good work from Amazon, DQ, from Google, especially Google, a lot of work from Google on this. Um, but the general gist is to, 
Well, there, there's multiple solutions. One solution is to have someone enumerate constraints for every like feature in prediction. Um, and like, what's good about this is you have like an expert figuring out, you know, like what is broken, what's not. Like you have your clearly defined SLI right there. What's bad about this is somebody has to enumerate all of these, which is not really feasible for all of our models out there, especially when you have like hundreds of features, thousands of features. And, you know, you get data distribution shift, right? Features sometimes monotonically increase, right? You have an age feature that's only going to monotonically increase. Um, so, so now somebody needs to be tuning those constraints over time. So that's like a huge drawback of these solutions when it comes to actually operationalizing the solution. Um, so even though, even though they're great ideas and they've been prototyped for a few case studies, like I, I just, I, they can't generalize. Um, they, they really hinder they they make it such that you need to have like a full time data quality engineer on every single ML team, um, and that I don't yeah it's a that's one area of solutions I guess. Another one is the automate everything approach, which is I use like distributional measures. I I try to measure whether this distribution of the feature of today today's feature is different from yesterday's feature, and you know if I have a p value less than point. 05, I will trigger an alert. And this kind of like automate statistics approach is really silly because one, it's not even appropriate to be monitoring p-values like this. And then two, uh, you get a lot of false positive alerts um, and you can't gain anything from those alerts. So that's, that's really what motivated us to think about this problem. Like I, we want an automated solution that doesn't give you so many alerts. Um, that's this paper. Yeah. So in particular, thinking about this, you you introduced partition summarization for data validation. Could you maybe give like a quick overview of how you developed the technique, what that was getting into? Yeah. So we found, we, we know we wanted automated solution um, for, I don't know, like an automated solution that didn't have a lot of false positive alerts. So one, we found two uh, reasons for like lots of false positive alerts. One is um, this kind of temporal distribution shift. Um, sometimes for these automated solutions, you compare like Monday's data to Sunday's data, um, which obviously is going to be different, but you don't really want to trigger an alert because that doesn't mean your model or your system is broken. Um, it's only broken if Monday is different from like last Monday's data, right? Or uh, a holiday is different from another holiday. You don't want to compare a holiday to yesterday, right? And so that was like an insight that you know, we had no other solution really did, which was to like preserve information from kind of each unit of time. So this is where it came to partition summarization. How do we summarize the partition and preserve information so that it will become useful when we need it in the future to see if something is an anomaly. And then that allows us to also um, now treat this problem as an anomaly detection problem, which is given today's data, summarize it, compare it to all the previous summaries, and only if it doesn't have any neighbors, then we can say it's an anomaly. Um, but if it has neighbors, then it's probably fine. Um, I don't know if that answered your question of like motivation and kind of why we did that. Yeah, yeah, that's super helpful. And I guess one aspect of this when it comes to partitioning is it is very important, as you said, that we're going to have temporal shifts in data. So Mondays are going to be a very different phenomenon from Wednesdays. But then when you do partition in that way, I guess you have um, the issue of, well, now if I'm dealing with a Monday's worth of data, say for um, traffic on a website or something, then all of a sudden I have a much smaller set of data to compare myself with. And then, so you start wondering, okay, at what point do I aggregate like enough data for the things I'm comparing with to be meaningful? How did you think about that? Totally. Yeah, so there's a lot of great literature in the database community around like quantitative statistics for data cleaning purposes. So how do you know when data should be cleaned? Like, because maybe these statistics are bad. And it, it's even it's even uh, stems from like the feature types. So like for uh, categorical features, um, 
the top K most frequent values is like a well-known statistic to monitor. If those change, then maybe your distribution has changed, right? So, so I really just like looked at the literature, applied these statistics, like just took those statistics and tried it um, as the summary. And then we collapsed things with partitions. And then we, we had to also do a lot of like decorrelation um, because sometimes features can be correlated with each other. Um, so that was a, like another step, but I don't think most people need to worry about that. I think that's like a fang problem, um, having like thousands and thousands of tens of that, literally tens, tens of thousands of features. Um, but we found that that, that worked. That was great. And if it works, then might as well write the paper. Yeah. So before we get into, um, maybe a broader paper that you did on operationalizing machine learning. I do want to talk a little bit about your streaming ML evaluation paper. And maybe as a motivation question, this is kind of super broad and we've sort of skirted around this one before. But as like the first broad question here, what do you think makes a metric actionable for an engineer developing a model? Hmm. Multiple things. The Okay, so the definitionally, if a metric is indicating poor product performance then it's something that you need to work on but then i guess like practically if there's no way to drill down on that metric to understand why then it's not actionable and then i think i think a lot about the, the practicality of things like if this metric uh like assuming that this metric actually indicates product quality do we even have the information logged or saved or any information to be able to drill down on this metric? Um, so, so things like, like if I, if I have monitored kind of, if I've done PCA on my features and I have these like components and I'm monitoring like the, the KL divergence between PCA component number three yesterday and today, and the KL divergence says 0.15, I like that is so unactionable to me because like I there's no way to drill on any of these things and you don't even know you don't know how to contextualize 0.15. Um, so that's kind of what I mean by actionable. So in this paper, you start off by making this distinction between the batch evaluation paradigm. We partition a data set into these fixed train valid test sets. And that's going to be very familiar to people who have worked on ML research projects. You're handed a data set, you get to iterate on this cool model and think about those problems. Whereas in streaming and the real world, we have real-time ML systems. And so we have to start thinking about things a little bit differently. Could you maybe introduce that distinction and then sort of some of the problems that arise with it in practice? Yeah, so I think the most important thing is that there is a recency bias when it comes to streaming ML. And I, I don't want to say streaming ML evaluation because almost all like production ML is streaming ML to some, I, it doesn't matter if you're producing one batch every day. Like I don't really care the, the methodology of how you produce the prediction, rather how these predictions are used. Um, and they're almost always used in a streaming context. And it's almost always the case for, for any business that today's predictions are more important than last month's predictions because last month already happened. There's nothing we can do about it, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So I think that that was the first like motivating thing where like, you know, we can't just like average the performance across the last week, equally average them and then come up with our metrics and, and produce that as a metric of success, because that's not telling us whether our model is failing right now. Um, and so one way to get around it is like to only monitor today's predictions, but like that's a separate problem, right? Because you, you want like an aggregation, a meaningful aggregation, not just like your point in time, um, performance estimate. So I say, I think like that's what really uh, motivated this like short piece or whatever. I don't know how much I, I'm thinking about it these days, um, I th it was motive. This, this piece was motivated as because I felt like um, a lot of people just uh, blindly apply the train valve test split to these production problems where it's like, okay, 
if I want to train a model to deploy today, I'm going to train a model on uh, two months ago's data, validate it on last month's data, and then deploy it. Or and then like do a test on this month's data and then deploy it. And you're you're really like kind of screwing yourself up in that sense because now your model was only a representation of two months ago's data. Um, so how do we like move away from this like train blindly applying a train val test uh, split to time series? I hesitate to say time series, but to like production problems. Like you really want to train on as much data as possible. You want to include the most recent data and deploy tomorrow. And I think that's what causes this like interesting retraining loop where people are always retraining as much as possible in production, making sure they have all the recent data. But that makes validation hard, right? Because if you're training on today's data, you shouldn't be validating on yesterday's. Yeah, so that I think that's like really the message I wanted to, to drive with that paper, which is like, how can we think about evaluating models, but also making sure what we deploy is like a representation of now? Yeah, this is, I guess, important in a number of ways and kind of ties back to that initial question about actionability, because you articulate your argument in this paper that the blind application of, OK, let's just take what we did in the batch paradigm and apply it to the streaming paradigm where we like do a sliding window thing now. That's really not actionable enough for people. Um, you talk about like a few different impacts of phenomena. So you discuss varying window sizes, representation differences. We've talked a little bit about delayed and incomplete labels. Could you talk about those aspects a little bit and sort of the wrinkles they introduce? Yeah. So delayed and incomplete labels, right? Like if you just don't have labels for your batch, your saving batch, then you don't get a estimate of the performance. So like, what can you do there? And often, actually, most of the times in practice, your uh, labels are, don't always arrive uniformly for your predictions. Like they might arrive like one chunk at a time, like every month when your labeler sends in things, or they, they might be dependent on your client. So let's say you have like 10 different clients that you're making predictions for, like one client might be like on top of it, always giving you feedback immediately. Another client might take five days to open the CSV, right? So you have all of these differences in behavior, which impact, clearly will impact your like accuracy estimate at the time. Um, so, so that's that's a delayed and incomplete labels problem. Um, I don't, representation differences. I think this was more for class imbalance. Like when you have like a, a very hard imbalanced class problem, it might just be the case that like, only 1% of your data was of a certain class in the last window, but this window, it might be like 5% or something. And then that completely skews the moving average just because your data is not balanced. So when it comes to representation differences, one thing you mentioned is that as class representations change, different metric functions might need to be computed. And I guess that kind of has a little bit of an impact just practically on the engineer who is thinking about all this. And one thing that you were discussing earlier was like, how much is it possible to automate for these processes? And I guess, you know, just like from the perspective of implementation, it seems like there are a few different solutions one could think about when it comes to that representation differences problem. You could have somebody manually look at, you know, class representation changes and determine, okay, this is the right metric to track for now, which just seems like a bad idea. Or you could just have like every metric out there sort of automatically tracked, and then we can pay attention to the right ones. Or you could think about maybe ways to automate that a little bit more. But I'm curious how you think about like, what is a good potential solution to that sort of problem, getting people focused on the right thing? I don't know. I feel like this is one of those things that I, I thought I wanted to think about, but I think there are other problems. Sure. Um, but left to, if someone else wants to research on this, let me know. I'll leave that as an open question to the audience yeah. then. <laughs> yeah, I think like just how do we do the same thing we did for data quality, or right? how do we bring that to also knowing what metrics represent success for a machine learning model, right? Because they're going to change over time. So automatically understanding that making sure that's interpretable, all of those things. I, there's definitely a paper in that. Yeah. So let's go broader then and start talking about operationalizing machine learning. You've spoken to the fact that 
ML app code bases are basically not very habitable or maintainable for teams. It's hard to find you know, your code, your data, your models. They tend to be scattered across services. Could you maybe speak to a little bit of like the particularities of that, what that looks like for an engineer, what they kind of have to deal with? Yeah, I think the day in the life of an ML engineer is they wake up to 500 Slack notifications that are automated from AWS CloudWatch. And they all say something like feature number three for model num- model ABC, or actually the model will be a UUID, which is from MLflow. Um, and it will say, yeah, feature number three from this model UUID has drifted by 0.8. Um, so that's what all these 500 alerts will look like. And then they will acknowledge in their um, team chat, like I saw the alerts, but they won't actually look at them. And then they'll go and then they'll open up their JIRA or whatever, and then they'll figure out, okay, like what is it that I need to do? And then start like, fix, do, do I actually need to fix any of these things that are broken? If, well, first, is the model actually broken? And the very experienced ML engineers have their own criteria for determining whether a model is broken. They look at five different services to see, okay, is first is a model outputting a prediction. Like that's if if it's not doing that, then it's definitely broken. So they start from the basics. Um, then they will look at like maybe a sample of predictions from some other tool, you know, some like uh, BI tool or whatever. And then they might look at some values of the features or like a sample of the data just to make sure, oh, you know, the data is coming in. They might look at, you know, like client patterns or behaviors over the last day, but all of these things, right? But like, this is all I like, kind of trade and craft and, you know, like somebody who's an expert has figured this out. And then they'll go about their work um, for that day. So I, I feel like, I feel like it's just like, you know, like, you and your ML engineer, you like just amass all of these skills and intuitions for when something is broken and and you you have your own kind of tool bench and you do this. Um, and I think it's hilarious that all these dev tool, ML ops tools companies are trying to like come in and replace this because how are you going to compete with like so much domain expertise like or like ML engineer expertise? Like they, they have... They have built this workflow for themselves for a reason. And I don't think any tool can come in and replace all of that. That's like a separate strategy or se- sorry, separate thread. Yeah, that that's really interesting. And what you spoke to, I guess, really does kind of highlight that difficulty, the fundamental aspect of there is so much tribal knowledge that is going to be specific to a company or a specific problem that is being solved within a company. And so probably your intuitions about what is wrong with the particular models in that group are going to look very, very different from one ML engineer on one team to even another on another team within the same company. And so when it comes to what are like best practices for an ML engineer, it feels almost like there is no answer to that question. And so how do you how do you think about like the picture you just painted does feel very almost fatalist about this, about whether this is even a solvable problem. Yeah, I think the MLOps paper that we wrote, the interview study paper, wrote that in a way to like try to document a lot of best practices that I was learning from people. Um, so hopefully, I don't know, there's some best practices in there that could be useful. But I'm not that fatalist in that like, I think it's okay for it to be a part of the job to use a ton of tools because like DevOps is like this. A lot, a lot of engineering disciplines are like this. What I'm very interested in is what are the pain points and the areas of dread in this workflow for people. So, so it's, it doesn't cause me dread to like write a SQL query, but it does cause me dread to look at 500 Slack messages that are meaning looks. Right. So I think like kind of going one step further into like, what are these areas of dread? Like how much does that impact my, my day to day and my job? How can, how can I, as like a tool builder, remove that dread from someone? Right. Um, like the dread comes in, like trying to match the UUIDs across different tools. It's not like actually going in and using the tool. It's like, mentally coordinating the transfer of information between these tools, right? So things like that, I think, can be 
definitely solved. Yeah. You spoke to some pain points that kind of arose out of your own experience. I'm curious in the process of your interview study, were there any pain points, things that people seem to dread that maybe you weren't expecting or just hadn't showed up in your own time as an ML engineer? Yeah. One of the things was um, in more established companies where the product metric is top down delivered so it changes like every quarter or something the expert so some so maybe q2 quarter 2 2023 right somebody is like embarking on this experiment to improve the product metric and then by the time q3 rolls around and somebody's created a new like top line metric that experiment that they did in q2 didn't improve the new top line metric so they don't get the like promo for that year or something right so like like that thing was not something i've thought about but it speaks to like you know deployment is always on teams like ml engineering and deployment and, and all of these things it's very team centric at the end of the day people don't get promoted for their work they're not going to do it um so if there's like a misalignment here how do we solve this kind of stuff that that got very i got very interested by that um from hearing those kinds of anecdotes Let's talk a little bit about the ML ops thread here. And you began talking about this earlier, but you mentioned you've seen ML ops tools that either just don't solve the right problems at all, that solve it the wrong layer of abstraction, and that it's hard to reason about this. And you were just saying essentially that all of this ingrained knowledge by really digging in and knowing the details of a particular engineer, that this seems hard to automate. So Could you maybe speak to some of the specific pitfalls you see in like current ML ops tools and maybe in some broad strokes, if we can't totally automate away a lot of that knowledge that an ML engineer is going to have ingrained with them over the process of gaining so much experience, what what role can these tools play? Yeah, uh, this segues right into the three Vs or whatever of the ML ops that we talked about in the paper. But back when I said about the dread, like where, where are people experiencing dread in their workflows when they're moving a little bit too slow, when they wish they could move a little bit faster. So this velocity is so important here. ML is such a highly iterative experimental nature or discipline, right? Um, how do you allow people to try a bunch of things and figure out what works? They shouldn't feel like, oh my God, I have to keep these ideas in my head until I can get results for them. Um, and that that's as simple as like, that, that's not just like training different models. I think like experiment trackers have like really won as a solution for like uh, model trainers and whatever everywhere because they like allow you to, they, they don't force you to keep track of like all of this information in your brain. You can now just look at it in one dashboard. So that's one thing, but not just like model training, but also like iterations on monitoring, like uh, figuring out like, oh, is it better to add a rule based on some broken feature or is it better to like try to train my model and and that causes me dread as an ml engineer because testing this is not very easy to do it might take time it might take collecting data it might do all of these all it's not easy right i can't move quickly here so like that's that's where it's an area where velocity can really help you right um so that's one uh early validation um how do we validate ideas early in the workflow so we don't like find out that they failed after deployment, right? That's a huge pain point for ML engineers because they, you, if you want to get promoted, you want wins and you don't want to be stuck on a loss or not know it's a loss until the end. Um, and then, of course, versioning, right? Keeping track of all sorts of things, cognitive load. Uh, how do you re- remove the cognitive load for ML engineers, I think, is the really interesting question they keep trying everything in their head um but just like like i think the reason why people really love spreadsheets is because it's such a low overhead way to manage all the information that they have in their head versus like if i use a dev tool i now have to keep the information in my head about the dev tool so like sometimes just being able to run that like what is the cli command what is the url that i must go to in my browser all of these these informations is is larger than the information that they have to keep track of, right? So, so I don't think tooling companies like think enough about these actual like the feelings and the the dread that the people have. 
There's another interesting question on the versioning aspect too. I think maybe the kind of obvious question there for a lot of people would be in retraining ML models or updating them or adding, you know, a new feature or something of that sort um, to start paying attention to, like what counts as a new version and when do you actually think about like what are major and minor versions? How did how did you think about that? I think it's so task specific. How do you know, right? Different people have different ways of managing this. Um, it's really hard. It's really hard. I think that's also another reason why people don't AV th- test things and pro- ML models in production as much as because you can't keep track of all those versions. Yeah. So you started discussing a little bit about sort of different tools people use in the ML Ops stack. And so experiment trackers was one. A lot of people would be familiar with things like weights and biases. One direction I wanted to take this that I know you mentioned you've been doing some work in recently is that we had ML ops and now we're kind of evolving new buzzwords. So we now have LLM ops and FM ops for foundation models, large language models as these kind of new buzzwords. So maybe for a start, could you describe a little bit about this particular problem, maybe how the insights you've gathered from ML ops so far? do and don't apply to to these ideas? Yeah, um, I think one of the bigger differences is that in traditional MLOps, you're focused also on managing like different artifacts and uh, different machines and different environments, et cetera, like your machine for training, your like data, your bucket for data collection, um, the tools around that, like it's just a lot to manage, but kind of in FM ops, especially if you're interacting with a model through an API, then you just have your API call and you're managing your data and you're like one environment where you're submitting the queries to the API. Um, so in that sense, it's a little bit different and the, the fewer things to manage, much easier to get started, but there's still like, I think the same workflow that we found in the MLOps paper applies of there's still data collection to some extent, there's still experimentation, right? How best do I design my prompts? What examples do I use in my prompts? And like, and the good, in fact, everyone's gonna end up doing this, but how do I update my prompts, right? Like as we get more and more usage. Um, So you have that kind of experimentation and you have the deployment, obviously, and then you have the monitoring, right? So it's the same, same cycle, right? Same whole thing. Nothing has changed really in the LLM ops, I think, except for just a few of the tools uh, managing. You don't, you, we don't, we're not managing hardware anymore. So there's like some pain points that have definitely been removed. We're not managing like individual modeling libraries. We don't have to have GPU, like all of these things. Those are gone, but the life cycle is still there. So in some ways, this becomes a bit easier because of, as you said, you're really dealing with just an API here. Totally. Or even like a, even if you're serving your own model, sure. Um, but I, I really want to point out that experimentation is still there and still very prominent when it comes to LLMOPs or whatever. Yeah. And you were discussing the role of this in prompts. Do you think that, I guess, prompting you can kind of map it in some ways onto stuff people have done in the past, but do you feel like it introduces any particular wrinkles or difficulties that might not have been there before into the life cycle? I think because it allows you to come up with something working so easily. Like I I like to think of a prompt as a model. Like that's what we're doing. We're experimenting to find the best prompt. And so the best model, Um, it might in the past, it takes some time and some energy to come up with that initial model. Whereas now in LML ops, like five seconds later, I can come up with an initial prompt that does something for one data point in my data set. So that's very interesting. Um, and I think just the ability to move so fast in the beginning, people then like forget to do a lot of the quality control and checks and think about like good software engineering practices and you know, like how is this gonna evolve later on? How do I learn from new data? People aren't thinking about that as much because now they think they have something right to deploy. So I think that makes it really, really hard um, for deployment of kind of LLM based solutions. Um, and another thing I think is the, the barrier is low, right? So now a lot of people can try to, can get like first working versions of these models. 
but they might not have expertise in kind of all the guardrails and all of the data processes that they must do around this thing. So, so it's hard to like see good predictions over time or like good outputs over time. A lot of times things break. Um, you want to generate, I don't know, some piece of text, but you have some obvious, like people talk about hallucinations a lot. I love when people talk about hallucinations as a problem with the model and not the problem with our usage of the model. And I think it's really a problem with our usage of the model <laughs> more than anything. So problems like that definitely arise. I want to sort of stay at, kind of staying at this very high level, but moving into, you've done some really great writing, I think in general, um, apart from your research on ML monitoring, we've discussed a lot of things that went into your posts on the ML monitoring mess, but you did do some really interesting work, I think kind of independently of what we've discussed for this series of posts. Um, among them, you looked into whether Prometheus, this existing DevOps tool, was suitable for ML monitoring. Could you elaborate a bit on like what you tried and, and what you found about it? Yeah, I, I, for, I really was interested in solving like ML monitoring issues. I think that's the observability paper came out of that. Um, and as you know, part of every solution in this area of research, you always are like, well, can existing techniques work for these problems? And uh, like for me, existing um, DevOps tools, like logging monitoring tools, aren't exactly a applicable to ML problems. I talk about in that post how um, in ML, most of the time we want to monitor like the result of some join. So like I want to join my predictions on my labels. Um, but in like traditional software, we just want like an aggregation of, I don't know, one value, right? Like the latency for an endpoint. And then I want to know the 99th percentile of that. That doesn't require like a join, right? That's not the result of the join. So in that case, I, I just felt like there, there's no way that like Prometheus would be designed to handle like joins at scale really well. Why would it? It's not, there's no purpose for that. Um, so, but, but it was just like a fun exploratory thing. Yeah, you, um, I guess, did sort of describe a lot of different challenges that come up here. Maybe a good place for us to be in closing, though, is on your post about thoughts on ML engineering after a year of my PhD, and I guess some of your updated thinking th since then in broader scope. So I, I already pulled a quotation from this earlier on the historical perspective that you've been developing, but you also kind of highlight that you've been thinking about MLE through the lens of, of data engineering, which I guess could be described as like a component, again, of the, the many, many things that ML engineers have to juggle. Could you just elaborate a little bit more on like how you're thinking about what it is to be an ML engineer and sort of how that separates has been evolving over the course of doing research on this? Hmm. I think now... Um... So actually, separately, I, I am, I don't know if I'm on the founding team or whatever to call it. I'm working with a generative AI startup. So I feel like I'm doing a lot more engineering than research these days. But I, I'm i now looking at ML engineering, at least in the past, like several months, like through the lens of, you know, what does it feel like to be an ML engineer? Like, what are, what are, what am I motivated by? Like, what do I have to do? What do I not have to do? Um, and as an ML engineer, right, like my number one thing is I need to keep my job. I need to get promoted. Like there are like some, I, I think a lot more now about like the political uh, mismatch between kind of what gets ML engineers promoted and what actually builds a working product. Um, I, I think that mismatch is like so, so big, especially these days. Um, this generative AI landscape. And maybe you, maybe you can blame the VCs or whatever it is, but I, I really think the ecosystem is just broken there. Um, so that's one. Um, I think another thing is just like the fatigue that ML engineers feel, especially now, right? Like there's so many tools. To, people are always building tools and it's not 
like I have problems with my existing tools. I have problems that I don't even know how to articulate, that is so hard for me to articulate as an ML engineer. And if you can define them for me, you've already built me something valuable because now I can like start thinking about it and make progress on those. So I think about that a lot. Um, and it's not like this, I don't know if that makes any sense. Like we're, we're in this like world where it's just like really hard to even articulate some of the problems that people face. The problems are always changing. And then it's not really clear like whether the problems are something that you should care about. Like distribution shift is a great example of like, okay, in most cases, does distribution shift even matter? Like if you just retrain your model, sometimes the performance drops. But like if the model is such a minuscule part of your product, right? If the product is really around the UI and how people interact with it, how people how your customers feel from it, then like maybe the ML is not even that useful. So, so why are we caring so much, right? Um I think about all of these things. I it's not a succinct answer to your question, I know, but I've been I've been working on a second blog post. I haven't posted anything in a year for this reason. It's, it's just really hard to articulate. Sure. That mismatch does seem very important. And the last thing you were speaking about too, I guess there's like the broader conception of, well, you are first when it comes to building a product, you are trying to solve somebody's problem. And there is that very easy to slip into mindset of, well, I have a particular hammer, a particular set of tools. And for a lot of people that looks like let's throw ML at this because it's the cool, new, exciting technology. We can raise money from VCs because I can just talk about using ML. I can make myself look sophisticated to my bosses because I can talk about what I'm doing. And so there's that mismatch of just like, I am an engineer or a manager or something, and I want to look really smart to people and like I'm doing something cool, but I might not actually be building something that solves problems for the people I want to solve problems for. Exactly. It's like if you're a startup and you don't hire engineers and you're building like a mobile app and you don't hire engineers, but you hire the best designer in the world. Like it can, it's great. You have a great design, but like you've not even, you don't even know what your product is and you have no one to build it. Like, I feel like that's where we are with ML. Like we've only hired people who know how to use pre-trained models, but we've not hired anybody who knows how to build a product. We've not hired anybody who knows how to like figure out what people want. Do people even want to feel like they're interacting with an AI? I this is a great question. I would love for people to to investigate. I would love to read more research on. So one of the things I'm realizing when when I'm working with a startup is um, there's like a changing bar, like or changing goalposts when it comes to user expectations for an AI product. Like in the beginning, like on day one, they might be like, "Oh my god!" Like the AI actually generated something that looks like it's not broken like wow like that's great and then day two they have all sorts of expectations that they didn't have day one right so if the user expectation is changing so rapidly how do you even build for this right so i think there's at least that's the problem that i'm facing right now it's so interesting that really is interesting yeah that that feels hard to study in a few ways i guess because one of the um, like you can interview users about this, but it's ultimately, I guess, going to be hypothetical in lots of ways. I feel like maybe users just haven't experienced that sort of thing before. And then especially when you speak to... It's new. Yeah. Yeah. Your, your question about do people want to feel like they're interacting with like a real person or something when they speak to or when they work with a product that involves like an LLM? Well, again, that's just something that it's hard for people to go through their bank of experience and speak about because that bank of experience doesn't exist. It's new. Exactly. Like one of the things I found was, okay, let's just hide the fact that we're in AI as much as possible. And now users' expectations don't change as rapidly. And I'm like, wow, like same, that's, that's great. But now it's like, okay, like, but I, I would love to hear what other people are thinking and saying about this because I feel like all the startups that I see out there are like really trying to emphasize AI as a product. And we are like really trying to downplay it. So I don't know. That's, yeah, that's really interesting to to hear actually. And I guess, um, yeah, I, I, I suppose it's like, I mean, this is so much an artifact of like the particularities of a company, but then also just like the very broad community push. And I think that um, 
you know, in like the machine learning community, AI and like AGI is sort of becoming acceptable ways to articulate what we're doing again. And that public limelight, I feel like the the kind of like hype cycle aspect of this and that macro set of trends, I mean, ultimately is going to play like a very big part of that. It's like we can't control what era we're in with how the public thinks yeah. about AI and regards it. But that does, I guess, in some important ways, as you're pointing out, influence, okay, how are our customers going to think about what we're building? Totally, totally, exactly. Yeah, and like AI is really good at some things, but it makes mistakes that humans would never in a billion years make. Um, So now how do we patch those really easily? I think this is a great set of questions and a good note to end on. So Shreya, I really appreciate the research you're doing. I feel like there are just not enough people thinking about these questions. And so it makes me very happy to see you working away at them. And um, I'm definitely very excited to read your upcoming blog posts and papers. I think many (laughs) of our listeners are as well. So thank you for doing this and for taking the time to speak with me. Oh, thank you for also, you know, having this and doing so much homework and being super prepared like on my entire career. So that's great. Or at least the last few years. And that is a wrap, my friends. As I mentioned at the start of the episode, you can subscribe to The Gradient on Substack to receive not just this podcast, but also our articles and newsletters directly to your email. You can also visit us at thegradient.pub, where you'll find all of that, as well as more information about The Gradient and how you could even contribute if you're interested. And finally, if you enjoyed this episode, we would really appreciate your feedback. If you'd like to leave a comment or review, we'd love to know how we can make this series more interesting and informative to you. And with all that, I'll leave you until the next episode.